Hi there, and welcome to A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Today, we'll be summarizing the entirety of A Dance with Dragons in preparation for the release of The Winds of Winter. We'll also point out some of the cool theories and conspiracies going on. So, let's begin with the prologue chapter of A Dance with Dragons. The skin changer, Baramir, has been gravely injured during his flight from the battle beneath the wall and is plotting to take over Thistle, a wildling woman, by walking into her body like Bran does to Hodor. She struggles and eventually manages to escape his control. As he dies, Varamir half regrets trying to take over Thistle's body, but also half regrets failing to take it over. He awakens in the body of one of his wolves. Later, his pack discovers Thistle, now a white, who, despite being dead, sees him through her dead, pale, blue eyes. Now, this chapter sets up some pretty interesting things. Firstly, Jon can survive being stabbed to death by walking into Ghost, long enough for Melisandre to resurrect his body if that is possible. Secondly, Varamir's mentor, Hagon, describes three abominations that a skin changer must never commit. Eating the flesh of man while inside an animal, Bran has done this, mating with a beast while inside one, Bran has not done this, and seizing the body of a human, Bran has also done this. What's interesting to note is that Varamir, the second most powerful skin changer in our story, couldn't take over another human being, while Bran does it easily and he is only a child, making Bran infinitely more powerful. So if Varamir could control six animals, it makes you wonder how many animals or people Bran could control one day. Chapter 1 is Tyrion 1, where after discovering that his wife, Tysha wasn't a whore, has murdered his father and fled to Essos. Tyrion doesn't care about anything anymore except finding Tysha and getting revenge on Cersei by crowning Marcella. Tyrion finds himself in the home of Magister Illeroy Mopatis, who hosted Daenerys and Viserys all the way back in A Game of Thrones. Tyrion spends a day wandering Illeroy's home, finds poisonous mushrooms, and threatens to murder a courtesan assigned to him by Illeroy. It might please my lord to strangle you. That's how I served my last whore. Do you think your master would object? Surely not. He is a hundred more like you, but no one like me. This time, when he grinned, he got the fear he wanted. Tyrion has dinner with the Magister, who tells him he can drink himself to death if he pleases, or find a new purpose. Mopatis claims that Westeros is in need of a savior, not Stannis, but someone from across the sea. When Tyrion asks who, Illeroy replies, a dragon with three heads. This chapter mostly sets up Tyrion's desire to murder his sister, and maybe Jaime as well. Claim Castle Rock for himself, and find Tysha by asking everyone he meets, where do whores go? Chapter 2 has Daenerys dealing with the sons of the Harpy, killing one of her unsullied soldiers. We also meet Renzak, who supports peace with the Meronese. Nobility and Skarhaz, who proposes killing one member from each of the Maronese nobility as retribution. Skarhaz and Resnek represent war and peace, respectively, throughout the Danny story. Danny holds court, and we learn that King Cleon of Astapor wants Danny's help in attacking the Yunkai, but Danny refuses. Then Hizda proposes opening the fighting pits for the sixth time. Danny refuses, but is friendly with Hizda. Lastly, shepherds ask Danny to pay for lost cattle eaten by her dragons. Danny agrees, but one shepherd remains behind and reveals the charred bones belonging to a child. Chapter 3 opens with John's wolf dreams, which are becoming more vivid and frequent. He wonders if either Bran or Rickon survive in their wolves, setting John up to do the same after being stabbed. John visits Stannis, who has just been rejected by Lyanna Mormont and the rest of the North. Only House Karstark has declared for Stannis. John reveals he is sending Gilly and her babe south with Sam, which Stannis obliges after learning Gilly was born of incest. Next, Stannis asks for the Night's Watch castles, which John refuses and instead offers to have his own officers command the abandoned forts along with Stannis' men as a garrison. Stannis resists and threatens John before allowing him to leave. Melisandre follows John out of the meeting and warns him of the daggers in the dark. 
John assures her he is aware of his enemies, to which Melisandre replies, You know nothing, Jon Snow. Chapter 4 has Bran travelling through the haunted forest. In search of the three-eyed crow with Jojen and Mira Reed, Hodor and Coldhands, who leaves them to deal with foes. Mira waits till he is gone before pointing out that Coldhands doesn't breathe, eat, drink, or sleep. Bran enters Summer and finds an abandoned village for shelter. As they rest, Jojen refuses to eat, despite his weakness, telling his sister that this is not the day he dies. All four of them are near starving, but they refrain from lighting a fire at cold hands. Instruction. Sleepless, Bran enters Summer, who finds the corpses of five men and a wolf pack that found them first. The pack leader is Varamir inside his wolf, but Summer, Bran, easily defeat him, making his pack theirs. The dead are men of the Night's Watch. Bran awakens to a fire, Cold Hands has killed a pig for them, but readers of the book know this to be a lie. Bran, Mira, and Jojen are feasting on the dead Night's Watchmen, who were the deserters from Craster's Keep. Bran asks Cold Hands about his black hands, and he tells Bran that the blood runs into a man's extremities and congeals once he is dead. Mira demands to see his face, which he refuses. Bran notes that he could not pass beyond the wall, Mira asks who the three-eyed crow is, and Coldhand replies that he is a friend, a dreamer, a wizard, and the last greenseer. Mira asks Jojen if he has dreamed this, and he says that they have come too far to go back now. Chapter 5 has Tyrion being smuggled out of Pentos and travels with Illeroy to the Rhoyne, where they will travel down the river to meet Daenerys in Volantis. Tyrion asks Illeroy about his motives for helping Daenerys, and his reasons are clearly untrue, and Tyrion suspects as much. We learn Varys and Illeroy grew up together in Pentos as thieves, until Varys was brought to King's Landing by the Mad King, and Illeroy married the daughter of the cousin to Pentos. Later, Tyrion asks how Illeroy managed to persuade the Golden Company to break their contract with Mir and support Daenerys, a Targaryen. When the Golden Company have spent their entire history warring with the Targaryens to place a black fire on the Iron Throne. Illeroy claims that the Golden Company just want to return home and Daenerys offers them that. Tyrion recounts the story of Hugo Hill and originally intended to become High Septon before he met Tysha. Illeroy, likewise, lost favour with the Prince of Pentos when he married a Lyseni bedslave called Sarah and made her his second wife. She died from the Grey Plague, but Illeroy never regretted loving her. Chapter 6 has Quentin, the son of Doran Martell in Volantis, disguised as a wine cellar's servant and trying to book passage to Marine with Garrus Drinkwater. In case you're confused, Quentin is the nephew of Oberyn Martell and is on a quest to fulfill a marriage contract between himself and Daenerys that was originally meant for Viserys and Quintin's older sister and heir to Dawn, Ariana Martell. Quintin and Garrus find no luck in getting passage. They think about returning home, since three of their comrades died just to get them to Volantis, and Quintin doesn't want any more deaths on his conscience. But his duty to Dawn and his father keeps him from turning back. They travel through the streets to meet with Archibald Ironwood, the third and final remaining member of their party. Along the way, they encounter a party of Windblown who are recruiting soldiers as they head to Yunkai to war against Astapor and Marine. Quinton isn't sure what to do, but Archibald reveals there is a way to Marine, less honourable but faster than the Demon Road, signing up with the Windblown Sailsword Company as they sail to war against Daenerys with the Yunkai. Chapter 7 has Jon summon Gilly and force her to take Mance's baby away with her to Old Town and leave her own baby here at Castle Black. Gilly refuses, but like Maester Aemon told him to kill the boy, Jon informs Gilly that on the day Melisandre burns Mance's baby, hers will also die. Next, Jon talks with Sam about the others 
and how little they actually know about their ancient foe. After that, John informs Sam that he will be sending him along with Gilly and Maester Eamon to Old Town, where Sam will become a maester. Sam leaves and John inspects the castle, learning two of Stannis' men were seen riding south. The next morning, John awakes to see off Sam, Gilly, and Maester Eamon as they depart for Eastwatch. Next, John begins giving out command of castles to his men. That includes Janos Slint, who was given command of Greyguard. But Slint refuses. The next morning, John gives Slint one last chance to reconsider, which Slint disregards, and so John executes him. Chapter 8 has Tyrion arrive at the Roin and meet Howdon Halfmaester and Rolly Duckfield, who take on supplies from Illeroy before leaving with Tyrion. Illeroy tells them Tyrion's name is Yolo, but Tyrion quickly changes it to Hugo. Illeroy packed extra gifts for the lad Young Griff and seems to genuinely care about him. Tyrion travels on horseback with Haldon and Duck and discuss tales of river pirates and the shrouded lord. Tyrion and Haldon test each other's book knowledge while Duck recounts the events that led to his knighting at the hands of Griff. They ride until they reach a pole boat called the Shy Maid on the Little Rhine. On board is the lad Young Griff and his father Griff. The older man reads a letter sent to him by Illeroy, telling of Tywin's murder by Tyrion. Griff is mistrustful and Tyrion is convinced he is no ordinary sellsword. He can read and is a knight having knighted Duck himself. Tyrion promises to serve Daenerys faithfully, but questions if Daenerys really has three dragons. Griff tells him to guard his tongue or lose it. Chapter 9 has Davos brought before Godric Borel, Lord of Sweet Sister. He was captured by Godric's men while trying to find passage off the island to White Harbor. Salador Sand's fleet had been smashed by storms since heading south from the wall until San, frustrated by Stannis' continued inability to make good on his promises, abandoned his cause, leaving his old friend Davos on Sweet Sister after Davos refused to journey south with him. Davos conceals this fact from Borel. Borel informs Davos that Lysa Arryn and Tywin Lannister are dead. We also learn that a shipload of Freys have reached White Harbor with Lord Wyman Manderley of White Harbour having pledged his allegiance to King Tommen. The news dismays Davos, but he hides his reaction and asks Borel to help him get to White Harbour. Borel tells of his meeting with Ned Stark during Robert's Rebellion. Ned was attempting to reach Winterfell so he could call his banners and join Robert's Rebellion, while avoiding Gulltown, which was loyal to the Mad King. Stark had arrived at the Three Sisters after crossing the mountains to the Fingers, where he convinced a fisherman to carry him to White Harbor. The fisherman drowned, but the fisherman's daughter delivered Ned to the Sisters. Lord Godric asserts Ned left her with a bag of silver and a bastard son. She named him Jon Snow after Jon Arryn. Burrell's father decided to let Ned go on his way instead of handing him over to the Targaryens, after telling Ned, if you lose, you are never here. Davos listens and replies, no more than I was. Chapter 10, John 3, has Melisandre preparing to burn man's radar in a cage. Made out of wood, despite John's pleas for King Stannis to spare him. Seeing the cage, Mance's courage fails him and he begs for mercy, denying his kinship his name, and shrieking of witchcraft. Melisandre burns the Horn of Juramon as well, so that the wall can never fall. As the cage burns, Jon orders his bowmen to shoot Mance with arrows, a fitting end for a man of the Night's Watch. Melisandre proclaims to the assembled wildlings that Stannis is their true king. Azor High reborn, Stannis draws Lightbringer, and promises all who serve him food, land, and justice. The gates of the wall are opened and most of the captive wildlings enter to kneel before Stannis, feeding the fire with fragments of weirwood, pieces of the old gods to feed Rahul's fires. Bowen Marsh thinks 
it is wrong to let thousands of wildlings south of the wall, and would prefer to seal the gates and let the wildlings defend the northern side. Many in the Night's Watch perceive that Jon has taken Stannis' side in the Game of Thrones. Jon denies this, but says that the outcome of the struggle is unclear following the death of Tywin Lannister. Jon shares a cup of wine with Clytus, telling him that Maester Aemon had shown him a passage in the Jade Compendium describing Lightbringer as both bright and fearfully hot. He notes that although Stannis' sword radiates light, it produces no heat. Chapter 11, Daenerys II, has more murders by the Harpy's sons. This time, they attacked fully armed, unsullied. Nine dead, including one of Missandei's brothers. Danny orders an investigation, allowing Skahaz to torture a wine cellar, and has the unsullied restrict themselves to patrolling the walls. Danny imposes a blood tax on the great families of Marine to fund a new mixed force of freedom and shave pates to control the city. Under the control of Skahaz. That night, Danny offers Missandei the chance to return to Nath, but the girl feels safer with her. Dreaming of Dariona Harris, Danny hopes that the Cell Sword will remain loyal to her. Danny goes to take a bath on her terrace, when she is surprised by the voice of Quaith speaking via magic. Hear me, Daenerys Targaryen. The glass candles are burning. Soon comes the Pale Mare, and after her, the others, Kraken and Dark Flame, probably Victorian Greyjoy and Makoro. Lion and Griffin. This is Tyrion and probably John Connington. The Sun's Son and the Murmur's Dragon. Quinton and Aegon? Trust none of them. Remember the Undying. Beware the perfumed Seneschal, who Danny thinks is Resnick, so it's definitely not him. After telling her to remember who she is, Quaith is gone. As the sun rises, Danny breaks her fast and prepares for court. At court, she gazes suspiciously at Resnick. His da pleads for the seventh time for the reopening of the fighting pits. This time, he cunningly presents former fighters who themselves willingly ask to be returned to combat. She promises to consider all they have said and then ends the session. Later, Barrister Selmy tells Danny how he escaped from Joffrey's guards in King's Landing and defends Eddard Stark when Daenerys angrily denounces him as a traitor. Barristan argues that Stark was against having her killed and the murder of Princess Rhaenys and Prince Aegon. But Danny replies, Lannister or Stark, what difference? She then asked to see her dragons, Rhaegol and Viserion, who have been chained up in a pit since the killing of the shepherd's daughter. But Drogon could not be taken and was last seen flying north to the Dothraki Sea. Chapter 12, Reek 1, Big Walder and Little Walder enter a cell. In the dungeons of the Dreadfort, cowering before them is a weak and foul-smelling man, who knows his name is Reek, but once had another name. Reek is so weakened and mentally ravaged that he is terrified of the two eight-year-old phrase. He remembers his attempt to escape with the bedwarmer Kyra, but that had been a ruse by Ramsay Bolton for his own amusement. Kyra had died horribly at the hands of Ramsay's dogs. And Reek has lost several of his own fingers and toes from flayings at the hands of Ramsay's bastard boys. The Frey boys bring Reek before Ramsay, who is with Arnulf Karstark and Hothar Umber. Ramsay taunts him in front of his guests. The reader learns that Reek is Theon Greyjoy when Arnulf Karstark recognizes him as Stark's ward. In his degraded state, Reek thinks of Ramsay as merciful and kind. Ramsay promises him a bath since they ride to war, and he needs Reek's help to bring home his virgin bride, Arya Stark. Chapter 13, Bran 2. Cold Hands has brought Bran, Hodor, Jojen, Mira, and Summer to a steep snow-covered hill. When his elk died, they butchered it for food. Bran initially refused, but gave in and ate their friend who carried them so far north. But now the food is gone, and they're all weak from hunger and cold, especially Jojen. They have to make their way up the hill, but the others are close by. The ravens urge Bran on, so they start up the hill. Mira has to carry Jojen. 80 yards from the cave, whites burst from the snow. Bran falls from his basket, and whites attack Coldhands as well. 
Bran is surrounded by dead men emerging from under the snow. Summer saves Bran, who enters Hodor's mind, to fight off whites. Bran's body is nearly disemboweled, and Bran wonders if he dies, whether he'll live in Hodor or Summer's skin before returning to his body to nearly die. Bran wakes up inside the cave. Cold hands cannot follow them due to the ward on the wave against dead things. They go deep underground, past roots and across a floor of bones till they reach a skeletal body sitting on a throne made of roots. We're meant to believe this is the three-eyed crow, the last green seer. But when Mira asks, are they going to see the three-eyed crow? Leaf replies, the green seer, hinting that he might not actually be the person Bran is looking for. Chapter 14 has Tyrion as Hugo, aboard the shy maid where he has been banned from drinking wine as they journey down the Rhoyne. Septa Lamour bathes naked every morning to Tyrion's delight, but he notes she has stretch marks from childbirth. Duck trains purple-eyed young Griff with swords. Though Tyrion is dressed in motley and plays the fool, Griff has charged him with writing down all he knows of Dragon's Law from his extensive reading. Later, Tyrion joins Howden as he educates young Griff on geometry, languages, and history. Afterwards, Tyrion and Howden play a game of Cybes. Tyrion has yet to beat Howden and challenges him to a wager for information. Howden takes the bet and loses. We learn later the information Tyrion won allowed him to figure out who young Griff really is. Chapter 15 has Davos arrive in White Harbor and notice that the city is newly fortified. He is initially hopeful to persuade Lord Wyman Manderley to ally with King Stannis until he sees the Lion Star, a warship bearing King Tommen's standard, docked at the harbour. Davos goes to a shady tavern and listens to gossip as he tries to work out what the Mandalays will do. He finds out that the Freys brought the bones of Sir Windle Mandalay to White Harbour and proposes of marriage for Lord Mandalay's granddaughters and that Wyman's other son, Sir Willis Mandalay, is held captive by the Lannisters. Davos knows there is little hope for his mission, but decides he has a duty to try. Approaching the Newcastle, he shows them his seals as King Stannis' hand, demanding to see Lord Wyman Manderley. Chapter 16 has Daenerys host Zaro Zondox, the Carthene merchant from A Clash of Kings. After viewing a dance by his naked male and female slaves, they discuss Danny's situation since she left Carth. Zaro is aware of the sons of the harpy and fawningly tells Daenerys that he fears for her safety, but scoffs at her attempts to abolish slavery and tells her that the 13 are willing to trade with the city in slaves. He offers her 13 galleys if she leaves for Westeros immediately. Danny tells him she will have her men inspect the ships and refuses his feigned advances to her, most likely because he is gay. She also learns that Pyat Preet and his warlocks from the House of the Undying sailed for Pentos after she left that city. The next day at court, she refuses the desperate pleas of Lord Gale to defend Astapor against Yunkai. The envoy spits at her refusal, claiming that Astapor will die without her help and is thrown out by strong Belwas. After assembling her council to hear the report from Admiral Grolio, she decides she cannot abandon Marine to Yunkai. When she summons Zaro to tell him, his flattery vanishes. He tells her she will die screaming and that he should have killed her in Karth. She has him thrown out of the palace, but the next day an emissary gives her a bloody glove. The Carthine have declared war. Chapter 17 has John inspect the Night's Watch food stores. Bowen Marsh informs him there is not enough to feed the Watch, the Wildlings and Stannis' men through the winter. John orders a cut in rations knowing it will make him unpopular, and tells Marsh they will find a way to feed everyone. John is summoned to meet with Stannis. Rattleshirt taunts John, showing off his new red ruby. Stannis tells John he plans to leave the wall and take the Dreadfoot. Unawares. Arnolf Karstar claims the castle is lightly garrisoned. John bluntly tells him that his plan will fail, earning scorn from the Queen's men. Stannis silences them and orders John to explain. John tells him several things. Firstly, unless Stannis wins Morris Umber, 
who was offering an alliance in exchange for certain conditions, a pardon for his brother Hothor Umba, who was fighting under duress for the Boltons. To his cause, Amba will cut Stannis' host to pieces as it crosses his lands. Second, the Dreadfort will learn of Stannis' coming long before his arrival, and Jon has seen the Dreadfort and knows a small garrison could hold out against thousands. Thirdly, with the imminent fall of Moat Caitlin to House Bolton, the combined armies of Ramsay and Roose Bolton will outnumber Stannis 5 to 1, and will easily destroy him as he lays siege to the Dreadfort. In addition, the northern lords Stannis seeks to rally to his cause have suffered generations of wildling raiders and will not be pleased to see his wildling conscripts crossing their lands. Stannis orders everyone outside except Melisandre and Jon. Stannis again offers Winterfell to Jon, but Jon reminds him that Sansa is currently the rightful heir and that he cannot forsake his vows. Stannis says he plans to give Winterfell to Arnulf Karstark and Jon rebutes that the Karstarks abandoned his brother Robb Stark. Jon promises a source of more men to Stannis, if Stannis will let him keep the wildlings to occupy more of the forts at the wall. Stannis agrees, and Jon tells him of the petty lords of the mountains. House Flint, House Wool, House Nori, and House Little. Jon counsels Stannis to march through the mountains, win the mountain clans to his side, then emerge to attack Deepwood Mott and defeat the Ironmen to rouse the North to his side. Stannis agrees that it is a plan likely to succeed and impress the Northmen. Jon also warns that the clansmen are deeply devout to the old gods, warning Melisandre that her presence won't be welcome. Melisandre surprises Jon by telling him she will stay at the wall. Jon ruefully reflects on how he has acquired a thousand wildlings whom he cannot feed. Chapter 18, Tyrion 5, has Tyrion and his companions aboard the Shy Maid continue down the Rhoyne. As they encounter heavy amounts of fog in the Sorrows, severely hindering their visibility, Yasilia insists that it is not a common fog. Tyrion is initially unconcerned and begins to make japes, but he quickly begins to reevaluate the situation as the surroundings grow more and more eerie. The Shy Maid floats past the ruins of a palace, and Tyrion remembers the brief joy he once had with Tysha. Fearing an attack from the fog, Griff orders young Griff to accompany Scepter Lamor to safety below deck. Tyrion reveals that he knows the boy Riff is in fact Aegon Targaryen. Although Tyrion is uncertain how he survived the events following the trident. He also comes to the conclusion that Griff is the late John Connington, Rhaegar's close friend and former Hand of the King. Tyrion also reveals his Lannister roots to the party, but there's no time to discuss loyalties or intentions. The Shy Maid is under attack by Stonemen. Tyrion helps to ensure the safety of the now-revealed young prince on board, but the dwarf is knocked into the water, dragged down by one of the Stonemen. Chapter 19 has Davos held for 18 days in a large, airy, well-furnished chamber with guards at the door and a view of the city's streets. Marlon Manderley takes Davos to treat with Lord Wyman Manderley at his Merman's court. Davos asks Lord Wyman to ally with Stannis. He is resisted. However, by envoys of House Frey, Rhaegar, Jared, and Sidmund, who have come with the remains of one of Lord Wyman's sons, Wendell Manderley, the Frey envoys lie to the court, saying that Robb Stark transformed into a wolf at the Red Wedding, and killed Wendell and several Freys. Davos asks for Jared's name before calling him a liar before the court. So Jared challenges Davos to a fight after the accusation, but Wyman prevents violence. The Freys continue to besearch Robb's name, and although Wyman and the other non phrase appear to disagree with their words, they do not prevent them from speaking. A young girl, Wyla Manderley, Lord Wayman's granddaughter, vocally supports Stannis and seems to sway the court. However, Lord Manderley threatens to send her to the Silent Sisters and then calls for Davos's head and the chapter ends with Davos being dragged off to the wolf's den. Chapter 20 has Reek pretending to be Theon as he travels to Moat Caitlin under a peace banner to present Ramsay's terms to the Ironborn garrison. The Ironborn are in bad shape. They have been long isolated from supplies, apparently forgotten by Victorian who brought them there before leaving for the King's Moot. 
The Norse Kragenmen keep them under constant siege and can no longer dispose of their dead. Dagon Cod attempts to refuse his terms, but Adric Humble kills him. The Ironborn surrender to Ramsay and hear empty promises of food before being mercilessly killed and displayed. Ramsay, pleased with Reek's success, offers him a reward of his choosing. Reek is wary of Ramsay's offer of freedom and instead requests strong wine. Ramsay agrees and further humiliates Theon by rewarding him with a promotion to the role of a dog. He meets Lord Roose Bolton as his own forces arrive at Moat Caitlin with a sizable number of Freymen, including Host and Frey and Aenys Frey, both of whom Theon recognises from his time at their side as part of Rob's war campaign. At this point, only about a fifth of the Northmen who went south with Rob have returned alive. Theon recognises the newly arrived bride of Ramsay as an imposter. She is not Arya Stark as claimed, but rather Sansa's friend, Jane Poole. Chapter 21, Following the departure of Stannis' host, Castle Black is quiet, with the exception of the training yard. Against Bowman Marsh's wishes, Jon accompanies a line of wagons under armed escort to deliver food to the wildlings who have taken refuge underground at Molestown. A riot nearly breaks out as Jon's men deliver rations to the wildlings, with many complaining about the small amount of food they receive. Jon promises adequate food shelter, and weapons if they help the Night's Watch defend the wall, informing them that they have the choice, work with the Watch or face the others alone. In spite of their misgivings, many wildlings agree to join, children, spearwives, and fighters alike. However, Sigon and the rest of the Thens refuse the offer. When the rations are all distributed, the wagons are loaded with 63 wildlings heading back to the wall. John remembers something. Mance Raider told him that the wildlings do not follow names or sigils, they follow strength. Chapter 22, Tyrion is dreaming of his Lord Father and the Shrouded Lord. In his dream, they are one and the same. Tyrion learns that after being knocked overboard during the battle with the Stone Men, he was rescued by John Cunnington and the prince forbade the crew to throw him near dead overboard. Tyrion is being treated with vinegar to reduce the danger of an infection with grayscale. The Shy Maid is currently docked, and to pass the time, Tyrion goads Aegon into playing a game of Cyvas with him, using it as an opportunity to probe the boy for information. Aegon asks Tyrion about his real father, but Tyrion can tell him little. He himself only saw Rhaegar once or twice before Robert's rebellion. Tyrion learns from Aegon that the child murdered by Gregor Clegane during the sack of King's Landing was a Tanner's son from Pisswater Bend, whom Varys purchased and substituted for Aegon in the Cradle. After the sack, Varys smuggled the baby Aegon across the narrow sea to Illeroy Mopatis, who made the arrangements for Aegon's upbringing. Tyrion jokes that it'll make a good story for the singers when he returns to Westeros, assuming Daenerys takes him as her consort. Aegon is stunned by this, having clearly never considered the possibility that Daenerys might refuse him. Tyrion points out that she is a proud, strong, and fierce young woman who is unlikely to appreciate a relative coming to her with a begging bowl. Certainly, not one with a stronger claim to the Iron Throne than her own. Aegon angrily denies being a beggar, pointing out his own army, the Golden Company. Tyrion responds that Daenerys has a larger army than his own and owes nothing to Aegon. Aegon protests, trusting in Lord Connington to win her over. Tyrion calls him a fool and gives him the following warning. Trust no one, my prince. Not your chainless maester, not your false father, not the gallant duck or the lovely Lamour, nor these other fine friends who grew you up from a bean. Above all, trust not the cheesemonger, nor the spider, nor this little dragon queen you mean to marry. All this mistrust will sour your stomach and keep you awake at night. Tis true but better that than the long sleep that does not end. Tyrion then suggests a different course of action. Head to Westeros instead of going east, land in Dawn and take advantage of all the problems caused by the War of the Five Kings. He points out that the North is in a chaotic condition, the Riverlands are devastated, and Stannis holds Storm's End and Dragonstone. The coming winter will starve out the realm, he then paints his foes as particularly weak, 
King Tommen Baratheon is just a boy, and all his potential regents come with their own problems. Jaime Lannister actively avoids the responsibility of ruling, and Kevin Lannister is a born follower. He will only take the rule if it is offered to him. Mace Tyrell will have to fight the Lannisters to become regent, and Stannis' unpopularity makes him an unlikely choice. That leaves only one potential candidate, Cersei. Tyrion is particularly scathing of his sister's ability to rule, comparing her to some of the worst Targaryen kings, noting that Cersei, in her paranoia and impatience, will undo all the alliances his father created to secure Tommen's hold on the Iron Throne, and adds that if Aegon acts quickly, he can take advantage of the chaos and make serious gains before Cersei is overthrown and someone more competent takes her place. When Aegon protests, asking how they can win without his aunt and her dragons, Tyrion points out he doesn't have to conquer the Seven Kingdoms, that he only needs to start winning victories, acting not as a beggar, but a true scion of House Targaryen, like his ancestor, Aegon the Conqueror. When he does, word of it will get back to Daenerys, and she and Aegon can meet as equals. Tyrion is convinced that Daenerys will fly to Aegon's side and immediately love him, as he is the last of her line, and she is above all, a rescuer. To re-emphasize his point to Aegon about trusting no one if he wants to survive, Tyrion wins the Cyvus game using a piece of bad advice he gave and which the prince took at the start of the game. Aegon does not take his loss well. The sudden burst of anger convinces Tyrion the boy might be a Targaryen after all. Later that evening, Howden takes Tyrion into Salhori's in search of information, where they confirm the rumours that Daenerys still has not left Marine. They learn the Yunkai are spreading slanderous propaganda and offering heavy bribes to convince Volantis to side against Daenerys, whose attack on the slave trade has made her enemies in Volantis. By contrast, it is learned that the Red Priests of Rolhor, particularly the High Priest Benero, are supporting Daenerys and preach Volantis' destruction if the city rulers side against her. Later, Tyrion convinces Howden to let him find a brothel and go searching for Tysha. He finds his way into a cheap brothel where he has sex with a Westerosi looking girl, wretches, has sex with her again, and then leaves ashamed of himself. On his way out, he stumbles drunkenly into a Westerosi man who takes him prisoner to be delivered to the Queen. Chapter 23, Galaza Galare, the Green Grace, appears before Daenerys to offer once more the suggestion that she marry his door, Zolaric, who is waiting for her. Danny agrees to speak with him, and though neither of them love nor even express much physical attraction to one another, Hisdar promises to put an end to the attacks by the Harpy's sons. Danny tasks him with 90 days in which she does not want a single attack. As a demonstration of Hisdar's promise, if he succeeds, Danny agrees that she will accept his wedding proposal. After he leaves, Baronston Selmy expresses his disapproval, but Danny believes that she still has 90 days to figure out another plan. To see if Hisdar can prevent the attacks, and if he can, she will marry him out of duty to her people. So Baronston tells her that during her assembly with the Green Grace, that Dario Naharis has returned. Danny commands to see him at once, overcome with lust. Despite her growing passion, during the meeting, Dario upsets her with his barbaric suggestions to butcher all the Marinese nobles, and she sends him away. Danny tells Baronston to forbid Dario from meeting with her directly ever again, but regrets her decision almost immediately. Chapter 24. After the disappearance of Tyrion, John Cunnington decided to continue their route to Volantheris. There, the former Lord of Griffin's Roost, Howden, and Prince Aegon arrive at the camp of the Golden Company to meet their officers. The company was previously led by Connington's close friend, Toyn, but now it is led by homeless Harry Strickland, a man skilled in negotiating lucrative contracts but cowardly facing combat in the eyes of Connington. After presenting young Griff as Prince Aegon Targaryen, to the highest ranking members of the company, the officers voiced their lack of enthusiasm for the complicated situation. They did not anticipate that Daenerys would decide to remain in Marine. They also bemoaned the constantly changing plans of Illeroy, Mopatis, and Varys, who did not anticipate Viserys Targaryen's death or that Daenerys would go to Slaver's Bay rather than Westeros. 
Seeing their disillusionment, Prince Aegon offers them an alternative, earlier proposed by Tyrion. Sail to Westeros with the hope of obtaining support from Dawn, in accordance with Doran Martell's own plan for avenging Princess Elia. Aegon reasons that once he and the Golden Company have begun the rebellion, Daenerys will cross the Narrow Sea to join him. This proposal is met with great enthusiasm from the officers, except Harry Strickland, who nevertheless has no choice but to comply. Once agreed on the new plan, Aegon is taken on a tour of the camp. Connington retires to his quarters, satisfied with the new situation, and impressed with the sight of Aegon he has not previously seen. He hopes to return home to the castle of his ancestors and repay his debt to his old friend Rhaegar. It is then revealed that he is slowly succumbing to Grayscale, acquired from the attack by the Stonemen, which is beginning to spread in his hand. He hopes that he will live several more years to see his ward sit the Iron Throne. Chapter 25 Quentin Martell and his two companions have joined the Windblown, a sellsword company of 2,000 led by a Pentoshi noble, known as the Tattered Prince. Their goal is to reach Slaver's Bay and eventually Daenerys Targaryen in Marine by deserting the Windblown when the time is right. The company was paid for by Yunkai to fight and kill the Butcher King's successors in Astapor, where they are currently mounted, three miles away from the gates. There, they face Astapor's still untrained new Unsullied, far less formidable than those that Daenerys has with her in Marine. Quinton learns the Windblown are going to Yunkai for provisions, before marching for Marine to fight Daenerys' forces. While they prepare to leave, he learns many malicious rumours about Daenerys. On the way to Marine, the Tattered Prince receives instructions from Yukai to hunt the, Ast to hunt the Astapori survivors and drive them away from Yunkai either back to Astapor or further north to Marine. It is believed that about half of those survivors are carrying the bloody flux. The Windblown will fight alongside the company of the Cat, another group of sellswords that has fought against them in the past. The Tattered Prince has, however, decided to play both sides and selects a group of Westerosi men, including Quinton and his companions, to make for Marine and contact either the Second Sons or the Stormcrows offering to defect to Danny, He selects Pretty Meris to command that group and suggests believable justifications for their decision to turn cloak. The group will have to be careful to avoid the company of the cat or the long lancers who know nothing of their plans and might kill them if they are discovered. This desertion is ironically what Quinton, Garrus and Archibald were planning to do at the beginning of the chapter. Anyway, we'll probably stop there, and we'll make this part one of three of A Dance with Dragon Explained. In the next video, we'll continue from chapter 26 to 50 for part two. If you can think of anything we missed that might be important, comment below and we'll mention it at the beginning of part two. Also, check out our playlist of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained if you want to see more Game of Thrones related content. <laughs> Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flight's A Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition. 